Hi, I'm Joel Bloom, president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. At NGIT, we believe that not only our students, but all citizens need to be informed about the issues facing higher education. As New Jersey Science and Technology University, NGIT is proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, RWJ Barnabas Health, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the New Jersey Education Association, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, and by MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by AM970 The Answer and by Insider NJ. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, this is Steve Adubato. I'm coming to you from the campus of NJIT. That's the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Why are we here? This is, in fact, the Voice Summit, uh, sponsored by Amazon Alexa. You've got about 2,500 folks from all over the country, programmers, people involved in something called artificial intelligence, all about voice. What does voice mean in our lives today? What could and what will voice mean in our lives tomorrow? That's what the people are here talking about at NGIT at this Voice Summit. We'll be interviewing those folks and bringing everything you've ever wanted and needed to know about voice to you right now. Janine Uzel. She is a former head of women in technology at GEA and currently uh, emerging market and tech consultant. You've had a fascinating career. Born and raised at the Beth, at Beth the Israel. Beth in Jersey. And then we Me lost too. you. Where'd you go? I'm no, no, another hospital uh, on the right. other end of the Jersey. city. It's okay. Okay, where'd you go after Still that? Still Jersey strong. So I grew up in Plainfield and um, went to Mount St. Mary's. My, I went to S's Catholic. Okay, my, my high school doesn't even exist anymore. Oh, well, mine still does. Okay, so, good, good, good. I went to right. the Mount and then left the Mount and went to North Carolina A&T for undergrad, studied engineering. But I have not lived in New Jersey in quite a while. My family's um, still here, but it's been a long time. You know, one of the things you were just telling me before we got on the air, which I want to share with our, our audience, the whole question of artificial intelligence and its connection to quote unquote diversity. Yep. Like, so artificial intelligence, you would, uh, in layperson's language, you define it as? So ultimately, it's technology that we are designing to really solve ton of our, tons of problems, all kinds of tasks that we're doing. But the message that I talk about, as I'm not a coder, haven't programmed in many years, what I'm focused on is that the technology is subject to the software. The software is subject. People come here sooner or later. The per person that's sitting there programming it. And if you want to have a full user experience and really touch the global world that we know that's going to be the end users of this technology, we've got to have diversity across the board with who's programming, mm. diversity in our teams, who's designing the products. We've ju we just got to make sure that we have an audience uh, or that we're touching a broad audience by having a broad audience of teams. Is that a, has that been a challenge? That is a huge challenge. Because? Well, it's certainly not because uh, you can't find diversity in the programs. We're going to school. We're graduating women and diverse cultures. But, you know, I think it's just diversity as a practice is not a norm. And oh, back so, up. Diversity okay. as a practice is not a norm. It's not a norm. Everyone talks about it's it. It's not what we think about truly every day. It's not. It is not. Even for someone like me, I may think and be comfortable in my audience, in my world, and so I could maybe just think about women in tech or uh, women from New Jersey or African-American women. It is not as much of a practice as we would think, and so it's got to become the standard of how we work. It AI affects quality, is depending though. on it. See, what's fascinating to me is that 
People say, oh, diversity is a really good thing, as if somehow by itself, just the goal of diversity is nice. That's not what this is. This is, if you don't have a diverse group of people involved in artificial intelligence and engaged in the software, that means the software and the ultimate artificial absolutely. intelligence is like this, not like this. Right. Am I over some No, you're absolutely it? right. And there are some instances where it's intentional. There are definitely Inten instances where where racism bias has intentionally been put into code. And then there are a majority of instances where it's not intentional. Do it's people just, know it when they're doing it? Some people, sometimes the practice can be that um, programming can, can be the result of racism or even influence racism. But the majority of the time, it's not intentional. It's not meant to cause harm. It's just that when you don't have a broader way of thinking, mm. and I'm talking about age, culture, where you grew up, your sexual orientation, all of that matters if we're going to have a full-blown product. Give us a, good, a, a concrete, relevant, understandable example of what could happen if the coding, if the um, software, if, if all that in voice is done by a group of a homogeneous population, um, very narrow, whatever, and not a truly diverse population. What, what, give, give us a concrete example. So an example is, you know, you're having this conversation with Alexa and she doesn't understand um, the dialect or the tone of your voice. She doesn't understand words that you might use um, that mean one thing uh, and mean something else in a different culture. She might not know the difference between how to make kale, sauteed kale, or collard greens. I, I, you know, uh, what's, what's well, the recipe of what I was brought up on her? Alexa, how do you make cornbread? Maybe she's gonna teach me how to make a muffin. Um, because she doesn't understand that. Let's stay on diversity. In my family, growing up, Alexa, what's the best way to serve scoongili? See? What's so gonna happen? Uh, what's a scoonge <laughs> or a jilly? <laughs> so Alexa may have, depending upon who is involved in the programming, may have a potentially a narrow ability Absolutely. to communicate, and you go outside that? Absolutely. But if the people come from all different walks of life, it increases the chances that that conversation, if you will. And it, it just an, it's creates an inclusion and a fairness for everyone. Everyone wants to be able to find themselves. And if AI is happening, we can't stop it, right? It's, right. it's going to happen. Artificial intelligence. So it's our responsibility as technologists, as programmers, as people that are running businesses or leading teams to ensure that the best possible product is yeah. what is represented. That's our job. It's our responsibility. We have to make sure that we are being a reflection of the world that we want to serve or that we want to sell to. And we alone can't do that. I can't do that myself. I can't even speak for every person that's a part of my culture. Yeah, but you can also, but what you are doing is saying, hey, wait a minute, let's make sure we do everything possible to have all those voices heard. My question is, how responsive has have most people in the voice community been to the conversation as a consultant you are driving right now. Very um, aha, like, oh, hey, I, I never thought about I that. I didn't think about that. Or we know it's there, what do we do? And, and some of the opportunities are very tactical. Like if you're talking to a business, it's very tactical. Where do you recruit? Where are you getting your population of the future employees? Uh, millennials and the folks that we're hiring now, they're in very different places, uh, studying in different locations. That's right. So what, what are you willing to do to stretch? Um, sure. Are you training the workforce that you currently have to be the managers that need to be in place for the diverse teams that you're hiring? Right? So that they want to stay. What kind of work are we giving them to do? What are we letting them design? So all of these things, uh, we're finding that people are, they're very interested and they want to know how to do it better. Because you know what? If you don't, the bottom line is impacted. If the right? product is suffering the, and... Then we're not going to sell it. Right. And don't right. we want to make money? Isn't that why we're here? We're uh, that, here to that, deliver a great and, product and, make a difference. and we paid for it. You're good. Oh, thank you. You made my job easy. You're good too. You still have the coolest glasses. <laughs> thank of you. Anybody. I've been doing this for 25 years. <laughs> Not only great glasses, but great conversation. Oh, it's good to talk Thank to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be right back right after this. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at infocaucusnj.org. 
Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome back my good friend Frank Longobardi, who is a CPA, but the other side of recognition for him is that he's the chief executive officer of a firm called Cohn Resnick, which is, where is it in the top? We are number 11. That's right. Uh, we have about 27 offices across the uh, the U.S. and our headquarters is here in New York City That's on right. 6th just, Avenue and 53rd. Just a few blocks away, uh, Cohn Resnick, uh, an accounting firm, does all kinds of stuff. By the way, I want to uh, disclose that I've done coaching, leadership and communication coaching for the firm for more than a couple of years. Right. You've done um, a great job, too. Thank you, Frank. Uh, one of the things I've picked up in, in um, coaching folks at the firm over 10 years, I think it's been, is how the industry itself has changed. The accounting industry, some of the biggest changes are? Incredible time right now. You know, we are a industry going through disruption. Uh, disruption? It, disruption. There is a lot of people out there saying that um, Barry Melanson, who's the chairman of the AICPA, basically said that by 2020, 40% of all of the accounting tasks that we do today as CPAs will be eliminated through automation and robotics. What does that mean for? those doing those you know, tasks? What that How do they have to evolve? Yeah, what has to happen is what's happening across some of the bigger firms, big four, big eight, <clears throat> um, they're looking at hiring different skill sets. So they're not necessarily hiring. I, I heard one um, big four executive basically say they're going to hire 50 percent less accounting majors by 2020. And they're looking at hiring STEM majors, science, technology, engineering, math, data analytic majors, so there's a lot of change going on, but, it, but it's happening at the university, and it's happening with inside the firm. So you take a firm like ours, we've got to change the skill set of our people. We've got to teach them to be more uh, trusted business advisors. Right. You've heard that in some of the training right. and coaching that you've done. More analytical? More analytical. Uh, less, it's going to be less mundane type work. Um, you're going to see people that are going to have to you know, look at data and look at anomalies in that data and then figure out what does that mean and how do you go about you know making recommendations either to change to, to make the as a changes trusted business or, advisor. as a trusted business so, so as you're talking about this thing i'm thinking about people who are, oh accountants or accounting it's ta you're doing tax returns of course there are tax returns being done right. but that's a smaller and smaller piece of the accounting equation yeah so so the other the other big trend you're seeing is that there's a big push right now within the larger accounting firms of advisory work, okay? Because advisory is consulting? Advisory is con tax consulting, uh, technology consulting, uh, transaction advisory, financial advisory, internal control work, uh, uh, revenue recognition. How do, you, how do you recognize revenue? So it's really, um, it's, it's going to be digital work. How does companies become more digital in their approach? So there's a lot of different types of advisory that we're doing today around putting in new CRM mm -hmm. systems. How do you analyze your marketing programs? How do you analyze your people? Um, so there's a, there's a lot going on in the advisory space. And what's happening with CPA firms today is they realize that in the future, because of robotics, because of automation, there's going to be less of the kind of the, what I would call the, uh, you know, type of work that we did for a lot of years right. where clients expected us to do a lot of the manual work and even though we're using technology, we're still doing a lot of the analysis. A lot of that's going to be gone. Clients well, are going to do it themselves. I want to talk about uh, charity work in just a second. Uh, Cone Resnick Cares, <clears throat> which is an initiative that I know very well, um, that is really important. But, but real quick, do the schools, the business schools that are training the future accounts, are they aware of everything you're just saying to the point where the curriculum's changing and evolving? Yeah, great, great question, because we, we've actually been partnering with a major university here in New Jersey that's working with- On the our, other side of the river. Yeah, working okay. with our folks and looking at our audit approach and helping us develop um, automation, helping us develop artificial intelligence, ways that we can start to take some of those tasks and automate them in the future. So yes, some of the schools are really buying into this. There's new majors out there called data scientists, you know, where that the schools are trying to train people to be a more interpreter of data as mm. opposed to just, you know, the type, the way we've kind of always done it, which is kind of accumulate the Status data. Status quo is not an so option. We not always an say option. That. Oh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Cohen Resnick cares. Every year there's a incredible charity golf tournament right. that I'm honored to, uh, to, to host on the back end, the, the, the dinner that's had 
The dollars that are raised by Cohen Resnick Cares, which is the philanthropic arm of the company, Joe Torrey Safe at Home Foundation, our great Correct. friend Joe Torrey, we are, uh, by the way, there's Cohen Resnick Cares. Uh, we are big Yankee fans, as is our president, Neil Shapiro. But the other one is the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. That if you actually, yeah. ironically, you go to Yankee Stadium, you see the big sign. Tell yeah. everyone what that one is. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, great uh, charity that we've been uh, sponsoring for a number of years now. And uh, what they do is basically any um, child whose parent was either killed in action or killed in training before going to action, they're going to provide an education, a four-year education scholarship for that person. And they track that young person because the person could be 15 years right. of age or two years of age. And they track them throughout their lifetime until that education takes place. It's a remarkable organization. Um, Hal Steinbrenner from the Yankees is That's on right. their board. And uh, actually one of our former partners, Michael Cohen, is on their board. And uh, they, do, they do a great job. And, and the other one, uh, sorry for interrupting, Frank. The other one, the, the check out the Joe Torrey, the Safe at Home Foundation. And Joe's been with... Uh, the firm and, and participate in events before. That is for women who are victims of domestic violence and their children, right? Yes, and they, and they basically work with, I think they've worked with over 12,000 over the last three years students, right. helping them through domestic violence issues as well as sexual abuse issues. Joe and Allie Torrey just do a wonderful Allie, Joe's job. Wife. Yeah. yeah, Allie, Joe's wife, they just do a great job. And I'm, I'm proud to say I was invited to be on their board and uh, I'll be sitting starting uh, you know, this year being- Congratulations, by the way, real quick. Uh, we do a lot of work with Make-A-Wish. We, we celebrate them, we recognize them. Um, another, they're one of the another other. Another great organization. Through our, uh, our social impact committees that we have throughout our offices, many of our offices use Make-A-Wish as being a, a kind of a foundation charity that we go to. Frank, let me ask you this before you let you out of here. Um, you and I have had a lot of discussions about leadership, about communication. You're trained as an accountant growing up, go through school, you pass the exam, CPA exam. But what I'm fascinated by is, the, is when you become the CEO and you have to make these ridiculously difficult decisions, <laughs> cutting budgets, yeah. dealing with, which is people, right? Well, there's a point to this question. What the heck ever prepared you to make those decisions imp impacting people's lives? That's not accounting training. Right. You know, it's interesting because uh, I, 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 I ask my question. I ask myself that same question all the time, and you know, some of it is really the client training I had as a, as I kind of grew up in public accounting because I worked with clients on their own issues, so I saw what some of the families they had to make the tough calls. and owners and what the pain they had and and, and and how I counsel them. So that was really helpful. And then when I got involved with being, you know, part after I had my own firm merging into J H Cohen, ultimately Cohen Resnick. Uh, you know, just being on the board and serving under CEOs like a Tom Marino or a Ken Baggett that were our co-CEOs when That's we right. merged five years ago, being on the board for all those years, that helps as well. So, you know, it's a little bit of uh, osmosis. You know, you have to, you kind of roll with the punches. I think the hardest part of the job is, is not what I know. It's the things I don't know. When you come in on a Monday morning and your life's no different, the phone rings and there's a particular issue or, you know, problem. <laughs> you plan for a different day, with. Frank. Right, so you plan for and a And there's a crisis day. that you're dealing crisis. with, and you got no but, choice. No, but it's it's wonderful. I've, I've got great people. I'm surrounded by great people and uh, great advisors, and that makes my job a lot easier. Well, again, I disclosed it before, and I'm proud to say I've been uh, coaching uh, folks for a long time in something called the Partner Academy. The folks are moving up, and there'll be new kinds of partners doing yes. different kinds of things. Uh, Frank Langabardi is, in fact, the chief executive officer of the 11th largest accounting firm in this nation. It is called Cone Resnick. Thank you, my friend. Steve, thank you. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're talking to Mary, who is the team captain of a team called Cindy's Amazing Grace. 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 Tell us about this. So my mom, Cindy Von Schmidt, passed away in 2016 from a brain aneurysm. Um, and we named our team after her, obviously. Her favorite song was Amazing Grace. But we thought it really tied into the 5K celebration of life to name our, our team Grace, but race. So yeah, look look at the logo, folks. Let me get this right. <laughs> it's Cindy's Amazing Grace, 
And then we just kind of did a play on words with race. Your mom, she was only 55, if I'm not mistaken, a brain aneurysm. Had she talked about giving the gift of life? So we actually were not really familiar with organ donation prior. She was signed up with the national registration. However, it was nothing that we really discussed. She was 55, young, healthy, fit. We never discussed what are we gonna do if you pass of a brain death. So when the opportunity arose in the hospital, I personally, I won't lie, I was a little nervous. I was not very excited thinking about what are they gonna do to her? I was nervous. Uh, of course, my dad and my brother said yes, absolutely, immediately. I had a lot of questions and concerns uh, and they were put to bed almost immediately with uh, the bedside manner of the New Jersey Sharing Network. I explained everything. They were you didn't even know who they were before. I had no idea. And now I sit on a council for the network and I do what I can to raise awareness and spread the word because it's an absolutely amazing thing and people need to know about it. You know, I'm curious about this. Um, your, your smile, um, your enthusiasm, your passion. There are some folks who might say, listen, if, if that were to happen to me or a, a loved one, I, I couldn't think about anyone else. I would only think about my own terrible situation, you say? Yeah, I can see that a little bit. But honestly, this is the best thing that could have happened to a horrible scenario. I mean, the death of her, of, of my mom, was horrific. It was nothing I had ever expected. She passed on Valentine's Day. I was at work, and I expected to come home and have a family dinner, and I didn't. I got a phone call in the middle of the day, and my dad said, my father's blind, and he said, I think mommy might have had a seizure. Um, she's in the ambulance. It's going to be okay. Come meet us. And I said, okay. My day stopped, I rushed out to the hospital, I met them, they said, you know, actually it wasn't a seizure, we believe that she had a brain aneurysm. And we were like, well now what? And that's when the sharing network came in and introduced themselves, and like I said before, at first I was nervous, but now I couldn't be more grateful. To me, you could be sad, or you could keep, she gave the ultimate gift, and now it's my turn to make sure that people know about it. Not just her, but the network in general and the amazing work that they do. They save lives. And she saved lives. Talk about that. My mom donated her lungs, her liver, her kidneys. She's helped multiple women with um, breast cancer reconstruction surgery through tissue donation. Um, one thing that I find really amazing is I said my dad's blind. She helped a child see again by donating a cornea. So she was my father's eyes for over 20 years after he lost his vision. They were married for 35. So after that happened, she was his, his eyes. And in death, she was someone else's eyes now, which I get goosebumps thinking about it and talking about it. But how amazing is that? Absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. one, one more quick thing before we bring the team in. Uh, on the sleeve, can we get a shot of this? On the sleeve, that is a gingerbread. It's not a man. It's a a woman, woman yeah, a okay. gingerbread woman. What is the significance of that? Because I know your mom, as I read about her, loved to bake. Mm -hmm. So my mom was passionate about a few things. She was passionate about baking, number one, though. Uh, she had a full-time job that she did, uh, but she also loved to bake. From um, October to after Christmas, she was in the kitchen, and we were baking together. We baked over 30 different kinds of cookies, candies. I'm sorry, you're talking about your mom, but I see your team coming in. She baked, go ahead. And then we sent those cookies all over the country and actually all over the world. My big brother's a Marine. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. He's on duty, but- uh, Thank you for his service. Thank you. And um, so we have friends all over the world in different bases. And um, so- This is the team. Yeah, and ahead. this is my dad right here. I'm Steve. Hi. Good to meet you. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're proud of your daughter. Very. <laughs> um, and uh, so we send cookies all over the world to different uh, bases, Belgium, Germany, Afghanistan, Iraq. Our cookies have been there. Her cookies have been there. And uh, so it's a big deal for us. We, uh, we all miss the cookies. <laughs> we miss her, but we miss her cookies too. I can't, um, on behalf of everyone in the public television family, and uh, we just want to say thank you for everything you're doing and um, the gift that your mom gave to so many others and to all of you for participating in this great race. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank we you. thank the New Jersey Sharing Network for being here because if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be here. And everybody else can make a difference, can't they? Absolutely, sign up. Everybody. Right. Go ahead, one more thing, go ahead. Everybody should sign up. 
No excuse, right? No excuse. Thank you. Can't be too old. You can't be too old. You can't be too young. Sign up. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Sharing Network, RWJ Barnabas Health, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the New Jersey Education Association, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, and by MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen, and I got my life back. The Sharing Network means to me hope, life, and everything. The Sharing Network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. Pay tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life. <laughs>